before we start, I wanted to. I'm telling you, I'm studying. I'm saying, I can't tell you how much I learned before. I'm going to be asking me to come to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming here. I know it's a beautiful Sunday afternoon, and we're honored to have you all here. My plan program is to have a great weekend. Minus Michael Lachel Kashaninos, but love of Mindu at Hasluta Saliva at program Shara Fala. We're going to ask um, our deacon, Minus Michael, to bless the event before we start. We're honored for him to be here today. Shimad Baba Bruna Rotko Shalmin, the Borok Tokman Wala, and Peshi for Kadigato Kadamiato, Peshi Tayra Sardano. قد هاد جماعتنا جميع لخا شاكورة وشمو قديشة قد خامت لهم خش بلالخ مزيد الخب وشلامة وهي مانو تاج يوم اللتن شمت برون خصوا قريش ومشي خام صاروا يغفر كولا آمين. آمين. خبراني سامي زودة لشان إنجليز بسيارة شو أنت لخك من عش لخا قتل لنا بضايا سيرة إن بخشان سامي زودة من عش سيرة بضاينا إنجليز. Um, I wanted to welcome you all to our appreciation event. And I wanted to start by letting you know that we started this event in 2010, 13 years ago. Uh, but we're calling this event 11th annual appreciation event because if you guys recall, we had two years paused because of pandemic. So this is our 11th year anniversary for this event. And the reason we started this event was to showcase what we have done, how we have contributed to our nation around the world with your support, with your donations. Since 13 years ago, and I'm talking about only 13 years ago, we have contributed or donated over $1.5 million towards different programs around scholarships, cultural, and humanitarians. Thank you. We supported numerous Assyrian students who are pursuing advanced degrees in the um, Assyrian related studies, whether it's language, history, music, or anything else with scholarships. We supported documentary films that raised awareness about our culture, our people around the world. We supported book publication and translations in either English or Assyrian. We supported one of the biggest concerts that were held at the British Museum a few years ago. I believe some of you guys were there already. And also that concert took place in LA and San Francisco. We donated to infrastructure, different infra infrastructure projects in um, Atra. We also helped with medical assistance, and we helped with establishing schools in Armenia, in Atra, or establishing different programs in those schools that's going to help our students to um, enrich their education about our culture, our history. But one of our biggest accomplishments, in my opinion, that I'm very proud of, is to um, we helped to establish a Syrian Studies Association. I think many of you guys are aware about that organization. They have started and are fully in, um, in um, work right now. Um, they're the Assyrian Studies Association. They are basically representatives of us Assyrians in the academic world. They are the source around Assyrian knowledge. They are a source of gathering for all the Assyrian scholars. They started um, a little before pandemic. Again, they were at pause because of pandemic. But I am proud to let you know that this, is, this year they will have the first symposium in August 11th to 13th at the Stanford University. We will send you information about that. Um, so we would be honored if you guys can join and support this group. So um, yeah, again, um, this event is about telling you guys what we have done. At Foundation, we have quarterly meetings. Every meeting, we are fully transparent. We show our numbers, we show our projects, where they went, who we supported, fully transparent to all our members and our supporters. 
At the same time, we wanted this um, event to be an appreciation for people who dedicated their time, their effort, their energy um, to make foundations so successful. So having said that, I wanted to introduce the board to you. These are the people behind the brain at foundation, behind everything that I just mentioned, what has happened. So we're going to start with the president, our lovely Sargon Shalpas. I am pleased. Our vice president, Annie Elias. I am Jackie Yelda, the secretary. Our treasurer, Tammy Benjamin. We are so delighted to have Tammy as part of our group. Um, she joined this year, and we just could not be happier. Our membership, Ramin Daniel. Education and Cultural Director, we have Dr. Jack Charbakshi. <laughs> Welfare and Humanitarian, we have Dr. Robert Karokian. <laughs> Social, we have Chris Hamzaev. Unfortunately, she's not able to be here because she's on a cruise to India. <laughs> Lucky her. <laughs> Uh, but she did help to organize all of this. She did all the work. We also have our lovely Flora Kingsbury. <laughs> and Ninve Magazine, I don't think our editor is here, but Dr. Ninve Maraha, um, she's not here. She's also, um, she's not part of the board, but she's definitely part of our team. So as I mentioned earlier, this event is not about showing our members and our supporters what we have done. It's also to acknowledge certain persons, certain personality that has helped so much with foundation. We are going to recognize one individual today that I know all of you guys love. She probably recruited all of you guys <laughs> to become members of foundation. Foundation is her life, her soul, her meal, her everything. So um, I am honored to acknowledge Flora Kingsbury. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Sargon to come and um. Oh my goodness, this is great. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. I almost want to cry. But for me, two things is important in me. Number one is my family, and second is a Syrian foundation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how long has she been, have Flora been a member? 79. Wow. She's been a long time. As you know, Flora Mehrebashim Mohammed, Flora Ashuri Kingsbury. Because her great dad, Alam uh, uh, he was a, a true Assyrian, you know, very dedicated and he did a lot for our Assyrian nation. You know, Flora Midget, uh, she's been with us for a long, long time. She is, she is a Thank pillar. She is like a pillar for the foundation. I can say that with no <laughs> hesitation. And she always remind me of uh, my cousin Julius Shabas. Indeed. Who was one of the also pillars of the foundation. So was others like Dr. Joe Elias and others, you know, uh, Yul Baba. There's many <laughs> who started this foundation since 1964. It was built, uh, established, and continue going forward, helping Assyrians, from Assyrians to Assyrians. Anyway, I just wanted to thank her and thank her family for letting us have Lord of all these years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
forgot to mention, I nicknamed Flora Malikta because she literally is the queen of Asturian Foundation. That's right. Flora Sargon was right. You are the pillar. Thank you. You are our supporter, and thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for your love, for your support, for everything. Let thank me you. mention one thing. Let me mention one thing. While we are living in the United States, most of our, our friend, <coughs> relative, or maybe immediate relative, they are married to different nationality. I told everybody, I did marry the American, but Bob did not change my DNA. My DNA, it says Assyria. Assyria. <laughs> Actually, he says Bob's DNA. I think he thought he was Assyria. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We are getting close to our presentation and our lovely presenter here. I'm going to ask Dr. Jack Trabachi and Sargon Shabas to join me here to introduce our lovely guest speaker. Welcome. Um, it's my honor to read about our guests. Our honored guest is Juliana Temurezi, and I'm going to read her bio. By the way, I have read so many bio of so many different people, and I'm just when I was reading hers, and I could, all I could say is, wow, wow. Truly, truly an honor to have you among us and uh, just read your bio. Juliana Temurazi is a leading international advocate, Nobel Peace Prize nominee in 2021 and 2022, speaker and writer, advancing awareness of persecution of Christians and other minorities in the Middle East. In 2007, Juliana founded the Iraqi Christian Relief Council to shine a light on the plight of Christians in her ancestral homeland and raise funds to deliver food, shelter, and medicine to Iraq. Her own unique story as a refugee has made her a strong leader and an unshakable voice for Christians and other minorities in the Middle East. Taymur Azi has advised many U.S.-based organizations and institutions on the issue of persecuted Christian in the Middle East. She has been consulted on developing policies, has authored many articles, and continues to speak globally to raise awareness on these important issues. She has recently partnered with different U.S.-based organizations to assist with the Afghan rescue efforts. Juliana's firsthand knowledge and expertise on Middle East affairs has been vital in her efforts to assist Christians at risk. Her personal network of contacts throughout the region and her unique perspective as a former refugee have been vital to her ongoing efforts to share the message of the plight of the Middle Eastern Christians and their desire for religious freedom and their right to live in a pluralistic society. Understanding the value of religious freedom, she has been known as a warrior against discrimination. She has spent much time in building relationship between the Middle Eastern Christians and the Jewish community. She is a lead and she is leading the effort among the Assyrians of Amer uh, in America to fight against anti-Semitism in different communities. Being born and raised in Iran, having direct contact with the Iranian in exiles, as well as being connected with people inside the country, Taimurazi is able to speak the current political and humanitarian conditions in Iran. In 1989, as a young woman fleeing the religious harassment in Iran, Juliana was smuggled into Switzerland. After spending seven days in a monastery in Zurich, she was once again smuggled into Germany, where she sought religious asylum. In December of 1990, she arrived in America as a refugee in search of religious freedom and the American dream. In 2000, 
She obtained her master's degree from Northeastern Illinois University. As a passionate leader who knows firsthand how education can transform lives in America, she has helped refugee women to obtain education to build their lives. With the opportunities afforded to her to achieve the American dream, in 2006, Juliana made a commitment to be a greater voice and advocate for the persecuted church in Iraq and those Christians who are still suffer in the Middle East. Amen. Since 2007, her ministry, Iraqi Christian Relief Council, has positively impacted the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, helping displaced displaced Christians and other minorities throughout Iraq and refugees in the neighboring countries with their basic necessities. Today, through her activism, speaking engagements, and regular media appearances, both in U.S. and internationally, Juliana has tirelessly shared her personal story and promoted the cause of Iraqi Christians throughout the world. She has been featured on Fox News, BBC, Wall Street Journal Live, Newsmax, Israel Broadcasting Authority, or IBA, and Christian radio programs, including CBN. From her time as an Assyrian Christian living in Iran, Juliana learned to be multilingual and is fluent in English, Farsi, and Assyrian. She will soon be releasing a book sharing her personal experience and the plight of her people called Daughter of the Nineveh. Juliana has a heart for those who have served America in uniform. She helped raise donations for the Wounded Warrior Project, visited veterans at the Walter Reed Hospitals, and gathered care packages for American soldiers serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. For her tireless service to humanity, Juliana was nominated for the prestigious Nansen Award through the United Nation, Nation Higher Commission of Refugees. She has received multiple awards, including Assyrian Woman of the Year, Michelle Malkin Investigates Bulldog Award, Advocacy of the Year Award, the Simon Weisenthal Center's Medal of Valor, joining the ranks of Sir Winston Churchill and the U.S. Congressman John Lewis. She is a UN delegate in Geneva, a member of the Simon Weisenthal Midwest Region's Community Engagements Committee, and a fellow and a member of the Advisory Council of the Witness Institute, which strives to continue the work and legacy of the Holocaust survivor with professors and Nobel Prize winner Ellie Weissel. These are just to name a few. Um, I'm honored for Juliana to be among us. I'm going to ask Sergon to continue with welcoming her. Thank you, Jack. Nice. It's unbelievable the amount of work Juliana has done, and she's still at the young age of 29. No. Let me admit it. Rabbi Baghdayek got it. You should reach the man. At least Rabbi Baghdayek and Benochon, Chirbatochon, did it with you long distance from all over from Chicago. We appreciate that. And I see some faces that I'd like to recognize. Asher. Yosef uh, is the chairman of the Assyrian Air Society, is here. <laughs> and Nino was mentioned, but Nenwe, Dr. Nino Maraha of Nino Magazine, thank you for coming. <laughs> and of course, uh, everybody knows Rabbi Kaisha Ninos. For many, many years, he served at Manorse, uh, as long as I remember, from the 70s. I remember. 
There you go. I'll have the floor. And and all the guests uh, are, who are here and members, without your support, we cannot continue working. And uh, I had the ple pleasure of working with Juliana through Assyrian Air Society, and she partnered also with the Assyrian Foundation and the Assyrian Air Society for over 15 years. So we've been in constant contact with each other and with the, through the organizations to help our Assyrians back home. She's made many, many trips back to Atra to help our uh, schools there, to help some of the, you know, the during Christmas and Easter, you name it. She's made many, many trips. Everybody knows Juliana when we go back home. So at Midget, uh, I'm very honored to see her here tonight and to give us a little bit. Of course, the latest thing we did was we partnered on, uh, the, you all heard about Rodana, Zalzal, uh, uh, the earthquake that was happened and there was a lot of need because believe it or not, the Syrians were had fled and were in Turkey waiting to immigrate and now the the earthquake hit and and some of them we lost they lost some we lost some lives and, and they need help. So this was the latest projects we worked together with Juliana, both Assyrian Air Society partnered with her as well as the Assyrian Foundation. Miokorta Juliana, come come to Okay. Assyria, a name which I fell in love with from a young age. Who was she? What was she made of? What was her essence? And what became of her? Assyria of antiquity was of courage and victory, of strength and resilience, of innovation and magnificence, of conquest and bravery. When I hear her name, I remain in awe of her, this bride of Mesopotamia. When I read her name, I shiver in intimidation, this warrior of Mesopotamia. When I dare speak her name, I utter it with utmost reverence, this mystical being of Mesopotamia. I knew her long before I came to know myself. I fell in love with her before I knew what falling in love meant. And one day, she mercilessly burned her name on my heart. I watched her quietly as she engraved it onto my heart. Every stroke was painful, but I silently accepted it. I welcomed it. I loved it. I'm thankful to have been invited to be here and to share my thoughts with you. Assyrian Foundation of America, a stellar organization with a sacred mission which impacts countless of lives, lives across the globe, is an institution which is led by a group of compassionate and visionary professionals who help fulfill its established goals. One must contemplate the very need which led to the establishment of AFA in 1964, and more importantly, the profound need for its continued existence. In mentioning the beautiful words written on your webpage, on Who We Are uh, page, every day since our inception, we declare our determination to be the window of hope to keep Assyria alive. What profound words these are. One must ask, why has her leadership chosen this particular path of service? Why do her donors believe in her mission? And why do you give so generously to this mission? In answer to these questions, I have heard a few say, people like us to do things like this. But this is not enough. This is not enough when it comes to the Assyrian cause. The answer runs much deeper than this. The answer transcends time and space. It comes from what has transpired in distant lands. It comes from the bowels of our sacred history. Dear friends, my friends, this afternoon I will share my heart with you. I will talk about exile. I will speak of victimhood. I will speak of hope and of responsibility. 
and about a concept called Hineni in Hebrew, Anaha in Aramaic, a cry of here I am for you, calling us forth from the pages of the Old Testament. On exile, those who know me know that uh, countless of times I've said I am in exile. I often quote the 12th century Jewish sage who lived in Spain away from his land. As he set out to return to the Holy Land, his ancestral land, Yehuda Halevi, said, my heart is in the east and my body at the edge of the west. Am I the only one who struggles with this concept? I don't think so. I see heads shaking. There are many Assyrians who struggle with this concept, or at least think about it. Away from our home, we're all in exile. But what does that really mean? How does one define exile, or in our language, galuta? Do we only mean an exile from lands which once we called home? Or is this a concept which is beyond a spot on a global map? Maybe some call our current existence diasporic. I call it exilic. Diaspora is a scattering, yes. But exile, exile is tearing apart of a soul. What makes me tremble is the thought that living so distant far and far away, or living so far away from our lands, our homelands, our nation soon will become more exiled, get away further and further from our heritage, that we will forget our sacred language and slowly fall apart and fall away, actually, from our Assyrian soul. I hope your emotions are stirred. I have faith that you internally are telling yourselves, I will never allow this sort of an exile to come to pass. But my friends, reality dictates differently. Truly, truly reality dictates differently today. Living in the diaspora will no doubt accelerate our sinking deeper and deeper in such exile. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Has being in the diaspora, in exile, become synonymous with the Assyrian identity? Does exile live in us? Is Assyria only a geographic location, or is this a state of spiritual being? I don't think I'm qualified enough or I have the authority to offer any answers to these existential philosophical questions I just posed. But I invite you to look for answers, to seek answers for yourselves. Our exile is an exile not only from our land, but also from our history, our memory, our soul. And until we return, until you and I return, we will forever live in exile. On victimhood, through my travels throughout the Middle East, I meet parents with children who fear their future. I meet university graduates who are in despair because they can't find jobs. I visit the elderly who in the age of retirement, rather than enjoying the fruit of their hand, now find themselves displaced in strange lands, physically sick, emotionally depleted. Unfortunately, the victimhood mentality has taken hold of their minds. What do these displaced Assyrians speak of? Why do our college graduates despair? Why are they hopeless? I remember reading somewhere that our great general, Agapotrus of Baz, was fearful and lamented that the victimhood will penetrate the minds and the soul of his people. Not all Assyrians, but most Assyrians, unfortunately today, are stuck in that debilitating mentality but we must stop it. We must be a part of that solution to stop this very reality. A nation will not survive, let alone thrive, if her sons and daughters feel disempowered, if they have no sense of their ancient connection that defines who they are, they will for sure sink into exile further and they will forget where they came from. On the concept of here I am, 
Without a doubt, every individual in this room and every Assyrian beyond these walls does not want to be responsible for the demise of a beautiful people with a rich heritage. Alas, at this important time in our history, the responsibility rests on your shoulders, on my shoulders, on our shoulders. We ought not to be afraid or disengage. We must rejoice and become more involved. Our nation, our next generation, needs us more than ever. We're a global family, aren't we? A family which is bound together with our, through our language, our traditions, and our, in most cases, our faith. So what is required for a family in times of peril to rise together, to come together, to care for one another? It is very simple. We ought to say, Anaha, Hineni, here I am for you. When Abraham was called by God, by angel, by the angel, and by his son Isaac, he answered, here I am. Isaiah too declared, here I am, send me. This is the first requirement. The answer to a summons is yes, but it has to be a yes uttered with joy and gratitude. Abraham Joshua Heschel writes, but the prophet's ear, prophet's ear, perceives the silent sigh. Let me repeat that to you. He says, the prophet's ear perceives the silent sigh, and that silent sigh is of human suffering. He continues, the prophet's word is a scream in the night. While the world is at ease and asleep, the prophet feels the blast from heaven. When I analyze this quote, I can't help but think, how many of us hearken that soundless cry? How many of us share the tears that are not shed in front of us? When I read the words, blast from heaven, my heart trembles in fear. I feel the crushing pressure from heaven. Hearing that cry from heaven, our lives grow heavy. Our lives grow heavy but that heavy has meaning. And we must hold on to that meaning, meaning because we are caught in a world of a meaning famine and a meaning crisis. May we each become prophets, awakened by the call from heaven and the cries of our fellow Assyrian. Any hope we may have lies in answering, here I am for you. On hope. I, like the, I liken the Assyrian nation to a beautiful crystal bowl which has been dropped and shattered into pieces. And each piece has been rolled to one corner, to different corners of a room. These pieces, albeit broken, still possess the essence of the very crystal that they came from. Although we find ourselves exiled from our homeland, away from our loved ones, our relatives, our communities, that once we were all together, remember we knew the tailor next door, we knew the butcher next door. We don't have that anymore. But we still possess a beautiful essence called Assyria. This is the defining essence of our soul, the core of our identity. We must honor this and emanate the light of Assyria to those around us, Assyrian or not. And this embodies hope. Thus we remember the words of Dr. David Purley, the great Assyrian, who calls us all to become messengers. He says, may we be the messenger, the symbol of Assyrian memory, and a vessel of continuity, and, a, and the creatures lending meaning to the soul of Assyria. Qomad avach izgedda urimza, usharyana aminaya ittukhrana turaya. I'm heartened when I hear the words of the famous author William Ziff, who proclaimed, eloquently proclaimed, the Assyrian past is a record in which the downtrodden Assyrian remnants can find a bright gleam of hope for the future. For the sacred fire of the great creative genius is buried in the wombs of their women, 
and will one day burst forth again in the persons of children perhaps yet unborn. Earlier in my speech, I posed a question about Assyria. I asked, what became of her? Let all the pieces of this broken glass emanate her light and entrust her to the next generation, a generation whose hearts beat for Assyria. Let us raise a generation of thought leaders, of artists, generals, politicians, scientists, successful entrepreneurs who possess Assyrian hearts first and know their first obligation is to their own nation. I believe AFA founders and the current leadership were called forth. You all were summoned and you answered yes. And when we are summoned, what will our answer be? Unlike Adam who hid in shame when in anguish God cried out, Ikevit, where are you? We're not going to be like Adam. We will be loudly proclaiming that we're Abraham's, we're Isaiah's, who said, Anaha, here I am, send me. No, that was your calling. Was there a moment uh, where you, an aha moment for you or a person who inspired you or what was the moment? I would say um, I come, I, I'm blessed. Uh, I think we're all, whatever fields we're in, whatever path we've taken, <laughs> I think it's only fair to give uh, credit to our ancestors or the lineage that we've come from. So um, I, I'm blessed to belong to um, both sides of my family that have always been involved in the Assyrian cause. Um, I'm closely related. Uh, Fredo Naturai is my great uncle. Lilith Ravita Lilith Morazi is my grandmother, who's known as the queen of the Assyrian heritage of the 20th century. Um, the first Assyrian flag was embroidered by my maternal grandmother. So I grew up on um, stories of struggle, stories of uh, devastating stories. My, my aunt, my cousin, I call her aunt, my cousin is here, and her grandfather, Kashai Mia and Urmi, was dragged behind his horse by a noose, by the Kurds and the Turks. So I grew up on these stories, and um, I, I often found myself wondering what will happen to our future. And uh, and I remember I was eight years old. I'll never is you know I actually am in Northern California. So there is I my teacher of my fourth grade I think or third grade was Rabita Lewis. You Madrash to Shushan. So if anybody knows her, please tell her I said hi. The uh, Foundation has donated and assisted Madrasa Shusha for many, many years. Oh, really? I know the record. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Rabita Lewis, um, I remember running to her one day saying, uh, Rabita Lewis, Rabita Lewis, Fredo Naturai wanted to find, uh, wanted to establish a land in Russia. Erroneously, I understood it, you know, wrongly as an eight-year-old. But I just knew that um, Assyrians needed so much. Right? So as long as I've known myself, I've been involved, uh, gladly involved. Um, uh, I volunteered for most of my life for in America to different call, to different in, in different organizations. It's something you can't when when you're called. You can't get away from it. Like Jonah, when Jonah was called to Nineveh, yeah, he escaped. He didn't want to go, <laughs> but he ended up going because he. We cannot say no to God if we're silent and obedient, and that's that's what I would say. That I'm. I I said yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, can you tell us something about any setbacks that, I mean, you've had such an extraordinarily successful um, career in life, uh, but were there any setbacks along the way? And if so, how did you rise to those uh, challenges? So uh, 
Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, I'm stubborn like my father, and I have perseverance and stubbornness from my mother on both sides. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so, so uh, I don't take no for an answer. Uh, but what what I really um, was heartbroken about is when we established ICRC in 2007. Uh, I genuinely was naive. Genuinely was so naive, thinking, of course the Christians are going to Western Christians are going to connect with their Western Eastern Christian brothers and sisters. Um, probably people didn't do it right before, and we're going to do this. We're going to change the world. We're going to change the Assyrian fate and. And boy, I was in for a rude awakening. Nobody cared. Not many. I shouldn't say nobody. That's a blanket statement. Not many cared. We uh, went to the Catholics. The Catholics said, well, you know, you guys have been plagued with these wars for most of your lives, for generations upon generations. Why don't you just pack your bags and come to the West? You can be Christians here. I went to the evangelicals, the evangelicals said, well, you know, you were baptized as infants, you didn't accept Christ as an adult, so you're really not a Christian, right? So you're cultural Christians. Um, it was really very difficult. I remember there was a Catholic church in Arlington Heights um, when their mission group invited me to speak. Uh, the priest actually said, I'd like to see her presentation first. So I brought the presentation and I showed him and he said, you know, I'm not going to let you poison the hearts and minds of my parishioners because you're saying that Muslims are shedding your blood and yet just last week the uh, local mosque was here and we had a great interfaith dialogue. The only way I will allow you to speak here is if if um, is if the, the, the mullah, the cleric, comes and debates you on everything that you have to present. I said, look, I'm not a theologian. I will tell the truth. I'm, I don't mind. You want to bring the guy, the cleric? Go ahead. I was never invited back. So I realized very quickly that not a lot of people out there care. That sort of changed in 2014 when ISIS put its brutality on social media and it was out there for everyone to see. Um, and so then they came, then they rose for, for a couple of years. Then they cared. But then it fizzled away. In 2016, 2017, it fizzled away. Um, so the struggle is to get people to care, whether it's the church of the, uh, in the West, whether it's Washington. We're not even on the agenda in Washington. I've gone there since 2008 so many times a year. We've established relationships. We're not on the agenda, my friends. They literally told us. We have an itemized list. We take in. You're not even on this list. They nod their heads. They call you in meetings. They say, uh, yes, yes, we care, we care. We go, we're going to have this, these fantastic events. And no, they don't care. Um, I think unless, honestly, I mean that, unless if we have a strong lobby push from each state, because we're in almost every state in the United States of America, unless what the Jews, unless we do what the Jewish community does, that in every single state there are representatives <coughs> that have accurate information to present to the members of the state, members of Congress belonging to that state, and we all come together to make that push from across the country, lone voices like me or the other person, the other person, going six, four, three times a year is not going to make a difference. So how did I overcome these things? Um, we just push forward. I'm a bulldozer. I push. I just go forward. Because it's not about me. It's about a fantastic holy cause that has been ignored time and time again. And I lament it, I mourn privately. Mm -hmm. There's not one week that doesn't pass by that I don't find myself on my knees begging God to change our fate, really. And, I, and that's the thing, I think we don't pray enough for our Assyrian nation and for the United States. I love America, I will lay my life down for America. 
But I don't think we pray enough for the Assyrian nation and the American uh, in America. So if we go down, down on our knees like the Ninevites did and repented from our ways and ask God for his mercy, something cosmically will change, I believe. Thank you for sharing that. Um, briefly, I uh, read about uh, in your bio that you were wrote or in process of finishing your book, The Daughter of Nineveh. The yeah. Daughter of Nineveh. That is obviously one of your history of your experiences, what you have come across. So I'm going to skip that history. I'm going to go to the current event, which a lot of folks are probably are interested to hear what is the current crisis. Um, what is the situation of our people in the regions of Iraq or Middle East overall? Current. So, um, so let's say country, per, per country, by country. So uh, let's take our ancestral land, Iraq. Um, from one and a half million in 2003, we have been reduced to, if we're lucky, about 100,000, 100, 150,000 if we're lucky, okay? Majority living in the north. Um, there is severe discrimination inflicted by the Kurds against our young people. As I said, they can't find jobs. I didn't want to go in detail with the, during the presentation, but during my monologue. Mm. But a lot of our young people aren't able to find really good jobs after graduating college. Um, so they're being discriminated against ethnically, they're being discriminated against religiously, both in the north and in Baghdad. Um, the political climate on the ground in Iraq is not safe at all. Um, the, you, the small mili military unit we had, the Nineveh Plain Protection Unit, um, has been pretty much destroyed. They're trying to rebuild it. Um, we lost the one seat we had in uh, the central government parliament. Um, majority of our representatives there are uh, pro-Iran, pro-Shiites, under Ryan Kildani um, in, in Baghdad. In the north, uh, we, have, we have representatives. But you know, if you think about it, our numbers in the north and in Baghdad are only five individuals for Christian seats, right? That's not enough. We're not going to move any political needle with five members, and five members being divided to begin with, okay? Um, there are laws that are against us. Um, election laws are against us. Anyone can vote for a Christian seat. We've been asking for the central government to change that, and also in the north, there's no one's listening to us. There's another law, uh, because Sharia law is dictating the lives of Iraqis. So when, um, and there is, unfortunately, that is happening where a woman or a man, they convert to Islam. And uh, when a parent converts to Islam, the entire family becomes Muslim automatically. There ha we have cases who've escaped. Mother has taken the children, has escaped to different parts of the region, trying to get away from, trying to preserve Christianity in her family, away from her former spouse. Uh, do we have hope? Yes, we have to have hope. Um, uh, Cindy Ojek, uh, uh, an author who said, uh, she said, uh, amidst craziness of um, uh, despair, there's sanity of hope. And people and organizations like Assyrian Aid Society and others that rebuild lives, rebuild uh, homes, uh, provide education, um, are vital. Their existence is vital in Iraq. However, what we need to focus on more is to create jobs. So those of you who are able to fund creating jobs, opportunities, small factories, large factories, hair, um, hair barber shops, uh, mobile stores, um, you know, anything, to give hope to these people is crucial. And Assyrian is, is a, has been a, we've, we've been faithful partners since 2007 uh, with Assyrian Aid Society, and I cannot tell you how important their work is. Um, so I think 
Ramzad Kesh being Yuatra, I think the secret of our existence in Iraq is a few things. One, I, I have grandiose ideas, okay? So if you don't think they're rea realistic, just bear with me. <laughs> I look at other nations that have been successful, and I like to adopt what they've done to our nation. I think those of us who are able to go back and buy lands back from the Kurds, we must do that. We must have power of our land back. Whether we build it, whether just hold that deed, just keep the deed. Say you are the owner of the land. We need our lands purchased back if we have to. Because nobody's going to give our lands back. They're not. America's not going to help. England is not going to help. Baghdad is not going to help. The Kurds are never going to submit to this. Request, okay? The second is creating jobs. We must create jobs for these people to be able to live dignified lives. How many of you came as refugees to this country? Show of hands, please. Okay. So you remember your conditions as refugees. Multiply that 10 times these people are living in worse conditions as refugees. And those who are in Iraq, a lot of them are waiting, their hand extended for aid from the West. We're not a nation that extend. we don't extend our hands out. We shouldn't, we're, pri we're proud people. And we need to contribute to that dignity that we've lived with all these years. So, and you're all, every single one of you in this room is a part of, a solu of the solution, my friends. Believe me, every single one of you holds the key to preservation of us here. What I spoke of, Maybe it was poetic, but if you think about the words, there is realistic ways that we can bring some of these things about. I talk a lot, so forgive me, I give long answers. So that's Iran alone. In Iran, we have about 6,000 Assyrians left. Um, Turkey, Assyrian, Chaldean, Syriac, I'll say it like that because that's what they say. We're about 23 to 25,000 left. Syria, Members of the Church of the East, Assyrian Church of the East, are prob I, I don't know exactly, and also don't quote me, but it's very small, very small. But the Syriac brothers and sisters is much larger, the community there in Syria. But still, I think from one and a half million or 1.3 million, we've gone down to five or 400,000 Christians there in Syria, from what I'm, I'm hearing. Um, where else do we have? So now the refugees. Refugees are in desperate conditions, my friends. Terrible conditions. When I tell you the, the illnesses that these people are inflicted with. We were at Jackie's mother's house, Auntie Nano's house yesterday, and I just broke down in, ex in showing pictures of these people who are sick. Kids have Hodgkin's lymphoma. They have uh, leukemia. This child has a brain tumor on his, in a, a brain tumor that doesn't allow one of his eyes to see, and they cannot operate on it because it's in such a sensitive part. Uh, kids have, um, um, they have uh, epilepsy, but there's not enough medication to address the problem. Almost everyone is plagued with heart disease, blood pressure, and diabetes, and they don't have the funding. So ICRC has a program called I Adopt a Refugee. So on a monthly basis, we send money to Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan to help these people with their medication. Um, now I'm working, we usually don't accept uh, in-kind donation because it's just such a hassle shipping, but uh, I'm a member of an organization called the Night Flight, and through U.S. government, uh, with Air, U.S. Air Force, they can fly items through the Denton program. Uh, to anywhere really that there is an air base. So they've done to Armenia, they've sent, we've sent to Iraq. But what we have to do is to answer yes and get involved, right? So that's, that's the situation of our people. That's a wide range. Thank you for that. Um, now, your organization as an ICRC, with so many other competing humanitarian organizations and very limited resources that we have, how do you ensure that your organization is the best option for donors 
the volunteers, obviously, to make a difference in the Syrian nation. Uh, look, we were established, um, when we were established, remember Ashur and uh, Sarbonjan, you remember when we were established in 2007? In 2008, we came to you uh, to have a partnership with you. So remember that? <laughs> we actually wanted to be under your wing. We wanted to be under, and I'll never forget you said, Ashur, you said, no, no, go on your own, go be independent, which was the best advice you ever gave. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm not going to speak, so I'm not in competition with, because I have so much reverence for Assyrian Aid Society, so I'm just going to put my heart out and say, I'm not in competition with Assyrian Aid. In fact, a large sum of our funding that comes from, majority of the funding for, for us comes from Americans. We send it to Iraq through Assyrian Aid Society. So, so with all that respect, I'm going to answer your question. All due respect to Assyrian Aid, I'm going to answer your question. So we are, like AFA, like Assyrian Aid, we're a very transparent organization. Um, we have, what I receive, I have 91,000 pictures on my phone, and I kid you not, you can look <laughs> at it, and half of it, literally, or 60% is of our work. So we get the names of individuals we serve their phone number and their signature. I have printouts of people's names that we serve. Um, we get videos, we get um, pictures, we get receipts from our partners. Whatever they buy, I get the receipt. What is their administration cost? I get that from them as well. So, and I'm on the front lines and I'm on social media, so constantly my phone rings or I receive text messages from people saying, your donation was late this month. Are you not sending any? Or thank you, we received it, thank you so much. So I'm in touch with people that we serve. And I think I place, not I think, I place a lot of importance on human dignity. When we answer yes, when we think of our, when we look at Assyria and we look at it idealistically only, we don't connect to the human level. We don't see that child that doesn't see. We don't see that father, that had, that mother who's been stabbed three times by ISIS. We don't see that guy that needs a retina, a, a, a retina change in his eye and he's going blind. But if we think about every individual as our brother and sister, we would step in and help. So what I would like to say that we place a great importance on the dignity of these people. So we go to the region, we sit there, we break bread with them. And I have to tell you this, I'm sorry I'm giving long answers, but there is this family, Janan and Sergis. They're from Baghdad. Um, the last two times I've gone to Jordan, they, she, Janan, has put a feast on the table for us. A feast. Where is this money coming from? They borrow it. They borrow it. And of course, I'm giving money to the father of the household before I leave because I know these people can make rent. They're behind two months' rent, but she's going to cook dalma for me. She's going to cook dhikhwa for me and all these other wonderful things. So that's why we have to honor them as dignified people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Asher kind of the next question because kind of like went in line with it. My question was, how do you ensure that the aid and resources that it's provided for you are distributed fairly and efficiently and that they reach the people rather than everything else? Sure. You can we, um, before I answer that, can we show the PowerPoint presentation? So this is just the part of the presentation that I usually show the American uh, brothers and sisters. Um, I've included just a couple of images of what has happened in the past just to bring history back to today. Uh, so Isis Savagery, this is the man who beheaded a lot of Westerners in Syria and was killed finally. Next slide, please. You know Nineveh Plain? Uh, that's really our ancestral homeland. 
it's extremely important for us to start jobs, create jobs in that region. And by the way, if you can imagine this, if you can cut Nineveh Plain in half, the northern part is controlled by the Kurds, the southern part is controlled by Baghdad. Next slide, please. So you know the Arabic symbol, uh, Nasara, uh, Arabic lettering. Somebody actually said to me, is that a one-eyed smiley? And he was being serious, huh? I'm not kidding. Um, next, please. These are Yazidi women, and uh, because you know we had Assyrians who were kidnapped and sold in slavery. Next, please. The beautiful gates of Nineveh. Next. This is what they did to it. In a matter of two weeks, a 3,000-year-old heritage of ours was destroyed. I actually went there in 2018 in Mosul in January and walked on the rubbles. Next, please. Uh, this is what happened the first couple of months of the dis ISIS displacement. People were living uh, on church pews. Uh, next, please. Um, in church halls, dormitories. Assyrian Aid Society actually opened the dormitory for these people. Next, please. This is baby Christina. Do you know her story? How many of you know baby Christina's story? Okay, not everybody. Baby Christina was three years old in a, a town called Baghdad, Karakosh, that, is, that was the largest Christian city in the Nineveh Plain. She got, they were getting on the buses, and Isis came to leave. And Isis came, grabbed her from her mother's arms. Her mother is handicapped, her father is blind. They took her, they were taking her away, and her mother, with uh, the disability that she has, she ran after the ISIS member and said, please, she's still breastfeeding. Please give my child back. And the guy said to her, you dirty Christian, if you don't turn back and get on that bus, I will kill you, kill you like the dog that you are. So she was gone from 2014 until she was recovered in 2017 in Mosul. Um, she couldn't speak Assyrian anymore. I mean, she was a child to begin with, but she couldn't understand her speaking. And when they brought her... Uh, the report, uh, in fact, we worked with Assyrian Aid and also with Sabina's organization to bring help to her. And uh, um, Imad Dadizo used to say to me, um, the representative, former representative in the Nineveh Plain of Assyrian Aid, she would sit, face the wall, and just not say anything, not do anything. They had been preserving her for a sheikh, but thank God they recovered her. Next, please. So our work, Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, we do um, crisis relief, we give food, we give medication, we pay for rent, we also do sustainable aid. Uh, we, I can't tell you how many wells we've dug, maybe 22, 24 uh, wells in the Nineveh Plain. This is not for drinking water, this is for hygiene water. We've repaired, we, in partnership with Assyrian Aid, we've repaired homes, schools, monasteries, Marmati, those of you who know Marmati, in, um, Bashira, we helped renovate uh, the. Uh, they had housed uh, 30 of those Christians who uh, Assyrians who fled Mosul, and we've supported education and creating of businesses. And the good news, speaking of hope, or, and what you can do, we sent six thousand uh, dollars. We've opened multiple businesses, but this particular one is a real success story. This family wanted to come back from France. They, were, they had left, they weren't happy in France. So ICRC had started a repatriation program. We said, if you go back, we will give you funding to start a business, we will help you with some of your rent in the beginning, and uh, help you with some medication. So this family didn't need anything but $6,000 to start their Kupa factory in Baghdad, Karakosh. So we did. And Iramia, um, Alamuni Ho Ashur's brother, uh, who was the head of Assyrian Aid, said to me about three months ago, he said, I said, you know, I want you guys to go back. Now I want to talk to him. Can you guys do FaceTime or something? He said, are you kidding me? We have to have two weeks in advance, place an order two weeks in advance, and then we'll go pick it up because it's been so successful. They deliver to different parts of Nero Plain and Mosul. So we can make a difference in these people's lives. Okay, so next, please. Uh, I have some images for you. So our impact. We've served people, in, uh, refugees in Australia, France, uh, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, India. Where else? Um, 
obviously Iraq. This doesn't have all the list, by the way. We've been in 14 countries, um, uh, Canada, America. So we've been in, we've served a great deal. Next slide, please. This is Philip. We started a barbershop for Philip. And then Philip's friend found out we started a barbershop for him for $2,000. His friend came and we, and I had partnered with a, um, a unit, a Trinitarian, Trinitarian monk order. And they gave 2000 we gave 2000 in partnership. And him and his friend uh, started uh, in Tilkev. This is in Tilkev, that's Philip. Next, please. So this woman, oh my gosh, this woman. She is in their seven. But you'll see her. She's aged just devastatingly. You'll see some of her picture later in the video that I'll show you. Her son died, and she ended up taking care of five of her grandkids. How is this woman going to care, take care of her five of her grandkids in their seven? So we support her from time to time, also uh, for main holidays, but also we give her uh, three, four times a month funding through a series aid. Next, please. Uh, these are that those boxes are in Jordan uh, but this is what it looks like when we deliver aid with us here in aid each food parcel cost about seventy dollars um, and they were 1,000 people according to uh, the list 1,000 people had lined up when we were in telescope um, getting aid next please uh, we help with medication this is Annabelle. Annabelle was seven years old. One day before ISIS attacked Mosul, she came to seek um, uh, uh, treatment in Erbil. She had can she has can she had cancer. Now she's cancer free because we supported her every step of the way. Every penny she needed, we gave. She's in Toronto, so we help with medication, surgeries, heart surgeries. Um, Sabina's nephew, we've helped twice. Uh, with whatever he needed for his heart surgery. Next, please. Um, clean water. Next. Uh, this we help with um, fixing their homes. Next, please. And what we do is we give them the opportunity for them to fix their own homes. So there's a level of pride and dignity there. We're there for Christmas. We're there for Easter. Next, please. Um, so I'll tell you the story. You guys are not getting bored, are you? Okay. Not at all. So I'm going to tell you the story in Lebanon. This woman, uh, she's, an, uh, she's a Syrian, well, she's Syriac, Syrian Christian. Um, and that priest was kidnapped by ISIS and held in Marbenam for 40 days. Uh, he serves in Lebanon. Uh, that woman, her husband, ISIS had attacked northeastern Syria, as you know, Hama was attacked. So this woman begged her husband, she's a nurse, she begged her husband not to go to work. He said, look, I'm just going to go to the factory, I'm going to relieve them, let the, let the employees go home and I'll come back. Well, he was captured. ISIS members contacted her and said, look, we know you're a nurse. We want a surgeon to come operate on our injured soldiers. What surgeon will go into the camp of ISIS, right? So no one went, and they beheaded her husband. And her child, uh, here she was six or seven years old, um, she used to sit, and you know, you're from the Middle East, you know at five o'clock in the afternoon, it's cartoon time, right? And uh, she used to sit with her father, watch cartoon at five o'clock. When, when her father is no, was no longer, she would refuse to get off that couch that she would share with her father at five o'clock. Every single, evening at five o'clock she would sit in front of a television that was turned off mm -hmm. she would refuse to move she would say this is where my father used to sit with me so this is the current state of trauma that has been inflicted on people that we never talk about we never talk about the trauma right effect on our people next please this is when i visited uh, I, after the beirut blast i went to lebanon and i visited them personally and also maronites we also brought $25,000 to the Baronites who were affected by that blast. That blast was a small Hiroshima, my friends. It was a small Hiroshima. It was devastating. But there was no shortage of miracles that had happened that these Maronite Lebanese were telling me about. Next, please. This, uh, she is, this woman and her daughter are in Australia now, but Kat, uh, Katrina, 18, when we visited her, she slowly, gradually went blind. And 
she had an accident and her front teeth were broken. So we paid for her medication and she has eczema from her scalp to her toes. I have images of her legs that she showed to me. Um, so, and her husband left her. He went back to Baghdad. She and her child, I'll never forget the story. She said, you know, there was a day, it, might, it was my son's, so her second son is going blind too, unfortunately. The third son was 12 years old, and she said to me, I'm not letting him go to school. He's selling, these are Assyrians. I mean, do you, do you feel this? These are our brothers and sisters. She said, um, I took him out of school, and he sells knickknacks on the street. He brings home three JDs a day. So it was his birthday, and she, he said, Mama, can I have a cake for my birthday? She said, I didn't know if I should buy food for the house or give him a cake. So she bought food. Next, please. Her name is Fonza. Um, this is all in Turkey. So many of them have cancer. So many have strokes and heart attacks due to stress. Next, please. Their joy is our joy. We sponsor school children's programs through Dominican Sisters of St. Catherine of Siena as well. Next, please. I think this one. So if you want to get involved with our organization, if you all belong to different churches, and my work is to speak to American churches. So please, if you can speak to your pastors and uh, let us come and present to the Americans, they need to know what's happening to their Eastern brothers and sisters. Uh, we have two main programs, Adopting a Refugee, is called I Adopt a Refugee. You can find this all on our website. Operation Return to Nineveh is with the Assyrian Aid Society. We do sustainable aid there. Those of you who pray, please pray. I believe in power of prayer. And if you are connected to uh, any media, we need media exposure. We, what we need to do is to excuse the expression. We need to make our cause sexy. Otherwise, no one is going to care. We cannot only come as we're victims, we're victims, we need you. We have to approach it differently. So if you're ever interested, I have some ideas we can talk about. Does that answer your question? How do we know where the money goes? I think that answers your question, right? Very powerful, yes. Um, being a frontline person, you are actually a frontline soldier. And you have many non-Syrian contributions to your organization. How do they help you to overcome your mission or to continue with your mission? I think um, I think being in this for 16 years, um, you're bound to have a big role in this, right? Uh, and when when someone someone when someone works from the bottom of their heart, they're genuine. They're genuine servants of the Lord and of their nation and the cause. But people see it right through them. And what they, what Americans that, but this mainly started after 2014. There were some isolated um, supporters that I, I still have a relationship with and I'm forever grateful uh, two, uh, majority of these big, big contacts came after 2014, internationally. Um, from, literally from the Philippines all the way to Argentina. These are academics, these are business owners, these are uh, people of the media, um, these are members of the Knesset in Israel, these are um, lords in, um, in England. I think if we are storytellers, we have to pass on these stories. So I ask these people, if they're not able to move the political needle for us, tell our stories. Tell our stories and be like in England, for example. Um, through the connections that I've had there, people have printed stories on the Assyrians over and over and over again. Uh, Philos Project I used to work with, and I was exposed to a lot of young evangelical uh, and Catholic, just young Christians that really had a heart, really they were so pure and they had a heart for the persecuted church. 
And those who stayed engaged, they uh, are now in different think tanks that they advocate for us, right? But it's not, it's not strong enough. It's not strong enough because we, our situation is worse today than it was in 2005. And as you were reading my bio, actually, I was reflecting on what you were saying, and I was thinking, honestly, I'm sharing my heart with you. I was thinking, yeah, I know, I've, I've sacrificed and I've worked, but what have I done? Our situation is worse today than it was in 2008. So what does that bio even mean? Really? So, have they helped? Yes. They have written. In fact, I have to tell you, a Turkey, a Turkey, I, um, a Turkish journalist's relationship with me. So I, um, Philos Project, I used to work for, brought this woman, and I tell the story everywhere actually, um, a Turk, and she became one of our fellows, uh, associate fellows. And I said to my boss, my former boss, I said. Why are you bringing a Turk? Don't you know what the Turks have done to the Assyrians? And now I have to work with her. And she's a journalist. He says, just trust me. Just trust me. And she called me. Uzai Bulut, her name. She called me. She said, look, Juliana, I want to interview you. I want to do a paper on Assyrians. And I said, OK. And I was very cold. And I started to talk. And I started to tell the stories of what happened to my great grandmother in 1919. She was burnt alive. Her uh, young son was killed, and you know, I, it, it, like everybody, right? All of us have had people. And she stopped me. She said, and I, we started to weep together. She said, "You know what, Juliana? I promise you, with my penmanship, I'm going to write in order to heal some of the wounds that my people have inflicted on your people." And that healed my heart for her. And. She recruited three Kurdish Turks to write about the rights of Assyrians to their lands in Turkey and Iraq. And you published, a, a Nineveh magazine published one of the articles, and it went viral. So have there been people who have helped? Absolutely. Has it changed anything? Unfortunately not. But again, we have to continue. We can't stop. I think we need institutions that uh, embrace our community, regardless of our political divide and our ethnic divide, or denominational divide, I should say, that is seeping into our ethnic, ethnic conversation. I think institutions need to um, be established to promote leadership skills among the young people. I'm not saying 25-year-old young people. I'm talking young children, mm -hmm. uh, to teach them what Assyria means and what you can do to help, help her stand on her feet. Um, and leadership is a variety of uh, topics, right, under leadership. I think before anything else, though, the key is for us to love one another. And it's not a cliche, really. We have to love one another. I came back from Iraq three or four years ago, and somebody said, so how is Iraq? I said, we don't love each other. Don't ask me about Iraq. Because I went from one meeting to another, they backstabbed each other. I went from one home to another, they backstabbed each other. I came back disgusted. And now, here, in this country, we're in such terrible condition. We don't love each other. We have to learn how to love our fellow man. But unfortunately, what we do is we bury him further when he's down. That's the first thing, I think, what we need to do as Assyrians. Um, and we, I think we should really start placing it. See, there are two tracks here, right? There's the diaspora slash exile. And then there is uh, the homeland. It, it's both equally important. And we have to work on both. Helping those who are left behind stand on their feet. Rebuild their lives with dignity. And the West, we have to 
there's so much that we can do in the West. Um, it's a, it's, I have all these, again, grandiose ideas from capture, how to capture census to uh, leadership, learning from other communities that have been successful, teaching them to our children, to their parents. I think we have to place a lot of importance on parents as well, not just children. Mo mother is the school, right? So we have to have programs for mothers so she can teach her children why a Syrian is important. And you guys do it so well. You provide scholarship in a, in a serious way. And I know who was behind that idea of reorganizing and reformatting um, that entire uh, program, scholarship program. It's extremely important. You're educating the next generation. And thank you, AFA, for that. I believe with every breath we take, there is an opportunity. The only time opportunity sees, is, is finished is when we stop reading. And, but hope, but that's, I don't want it to be an idealistic answer. With hope comes responsibility. Yes. And we have to step in the ring, in a real way, in a loving way, in a respectful way, in order for us to, and we're, we have very, you know, a lot of people say, Oh, little and right? We don't have money. We uh, are a poor nation. We have to stop that kind of talk. That self-talk is bitter. It's destructive. We're not a miskinta nation. We're not. We have fantastic scientists. One is sitting right there, Dr. Um, Karokian. So we have great scientists. We, we keep on saying the Jewish community has it, the Armenian, but we do too. We just don't embrace them and bring them in our community. So we have to create a nest, a loving nest, to bring these fantastic thought leaders, bring them back into the community, um, and, uh, and work together strategically. If we don't have strategists in our, in our midst, then let's seek it elsewhere. But we need a strat strategic plan to go forward. So now we all think of that, and we all know that we are at a level of service to our nations. So the people that they're following us, next generation, young people, how do you motivate them? How do you motivate them to think of our motherland our nations, our people suffering, and um, how do they get involved? What do they need to do to do their shares? That's the next generation that following us. Because we become aware of people like you, frontline service, frontline warriors. We see things, our hearts move, our emotion moves, we want to help but our younger generation is missing. So how do we motivate them? Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, in fact, in fact, what struck me is just what you just said. Why do we not have the younger crowd here? Where is it? That's the first thing when I walked in. That's, I think we have a young lady in the back, yeah? <laughs> I'm very happy you're here, Sita. What is your name? Iliana, one more on the other side, okay? Oh, yeah. Then Bogza. Hazan. Shlama la Hazis. Shemahmudi Lelebi. Inana. Inana. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you for being here. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll address them for a minute, okay? So I was presenting to a Jew and uh, to a. Um, Byzantine Catholic community 11 years ago and uh, they uh, the church called me back and they donate they had put us on um, their or we were the only mission they adopted for the month of Lent so they gave everything for everything they raised for the whole month of Lent and we're sending it for medication to Lebanon so this guy comes up to me last week and he says you know you remember you came here I said, yes, I remember, he said, but I couldn't remember when it was. So he said, he said it was 11 years ago. He said, my daughter was 11 years old. She was listening to you. She said, she walked away, she said, 
um, I want to grow up and help her people. How do I do that? She just graduated law school at 22 or whatever, at political science at 22. She's going to law school. She's applied to go to law school for human rights. So his, her father said, I can't thank you enough. Whatever you said penetrated her heart and paved the way for her future. Now she's going to be a human rights lawyer. Wow. So, and in, I think he's Indian. I, I, I can't even pronounce his name. But he, his quote is, um, a man is wise if he knows the, the seeds he plants, he will never tr see the trees that will um, uh, flourish one day. And he will never rest under the shade of those trees because he will no, be no longer. But we're planting seeds today. And the stories that you will pass on to others, you're planting seeds. You don't know what will change. This Denton program I told you about, the night flight program, came about after one of my speeches in Savannah to an American uh, order. The guy listened to me and he said, well, we're going to have to do something about it. And he went ahead and started, they went ahead and started the night flight with a K that flies aid for Armenia and for Iraq and other places through the Denton program. So I'm very happy you, you're uh, Iliana and Inanna. I mean, talking about Sima Rava, and I really hope that there is a message, a small message that you will take with you today. So these guys are our future, and what can, what should we do? We have to honor them and respect them. We have to encourage them to first love and love their nation, and educate, read. You guys, do you guys read? <laughs> Please read. <laughs> Something's happening in our nation which breaks my heart and keeps me up at night. We are not, I don't see a lot of people reading anymore. We have to read, read great literature. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Proust, and Kafka, and others, really, because that makes a difference in our daily life. We realize that the suffering is not just ours. Like Dostoevsky says, who, who says we're not supposed to suffer in life? Of course, suffering is a part of life. But the key is how to manage it. So we have to give hope to our young generation and rise to stand with them, next to them. And the young generation has to honor. That's something missing that is missing among our older than you guys. The other, like the middle of between me and them. There is another generation, right? They don't honor the work of those that have come before them. They're a little too critical in a very negative way of those who've come before them. We have to honor Kyoso Hong Huara, who it is the, th the thorns that have gone in your feet. You've opened the path. You've paved the path. And we have to teach that to our young generation to honor those because they did what they thought was right. And remaining indifferent is dangerous. Opposite of hate, opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. When we stop caring, that's worse than hating something. I'm going to do my last questions, hopefully. Uh and allow some people if they have questions at, at the end. But uh, ICRC is a, obviously a fantastic organization that you have a great mission in mind and you're achieving. So, and you are the leader. And I'm sure you're struggling with some of the issues as a leader does. Awesome. And those main issues that I have encountered my life experiences as our moral and ethic leaderships. How do you see that an effective leader could have moral values and ethical values? Thank you for that question. I, ICRC would not be able to exist uh, without partners like AFA uh, who have supported us. 
and in having a relationship with an ethical organization like AFA um, means a real partnership between two leadership. Moral leader, um, before I finish, or after I finish my answer about the moral leadership, I'd like to show two videos of our work with AFA so you see what the donations do. I think moral leadership has different facets. One, the leader has to see the other side, the other person, as a human, as a dignified human being, as a creation of God. We have to see God in every human we come across with and treat them with dignity. Um, I think not, look, I've been in very difficult situations where emotions run high. But we have to take a moment and breathe before we react. I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to send a fiery email, but I've taken a step back and I've remained quiet um, and I've pondered. I think thinking uh, about the person that we're dealing with and seeing them as a, as a fellow human is extremely important. That's one aspect. The other is answering, here I am. That's also a part of leadership, right? Whether it's with someone who is in the facility world that is cleaning the hallways to your vice president. They're equal. You have to treat them equally with respect. And when you give respect, you return, you get return, uh, respect in return. I think being organized is extremely, extremely important. And that goes into the morality of everything. Jordan Peterson says, clean, uh, make your bed. It's such a simple thing, but it's true. I feel when my home is in disarray, I'm in disarray. And when I walk in someone's house, or a nation, or a government, or, or any entity, because what's government? They're human beings, right? When I'm walking into a space and it's not organized, there is disarray behind the scenes, internally. So we have to be organized. Our space has to be organized. And our thoughts become peaceful and organized. I think that's extremely important. And that's just in general in the leadership world. I think being able to uh, understand the importance of a priority is critical. Um, for me, the pain of our people across the globe is important. But who is suffering the most? Unfortunately, it's the refugees. Even their situation is worse than the ones in Iraq. So we need to be able to prioritize them. Um, I think not being indifferent is important. Uh, seeing the importance of um, not being a spectator and giving up is, is crucial in a leadership role. Um, can you look at a child that you're in a carnival and you look around and you, you look at a child that is hungry, what do you do? Do you turn your face and continue having a good time? That's moral leadership. You tend to the need of that child. And remaining with God is extremely, having quiet time with God is extremely important. Because he said, um, be silent and know of God. Is that what how he says it? Yes. Oh my God, it's right in front of my house. It's right by my bed, uh, bed stand. Be, be still and know that I'm God. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that is, that I look at that every single morning. And that's a model I live by. Because he um, has expectations of me. He's giving me skills that I have to respond to. And yet, he's the captain of the ship for me in my life. Uh, I want to show the great work we've done together. So we've worked, we've partnered three times with AFA. Uh, once for Armenia, once for Lebanon, and once uh, in the recent calamity of the earthquake.
I am in the city of Iskandaron, which it's been heavily, heavily damaged. It's unreal what we're seeing. Um, words cannot not describe what people have sustained. There are people that this house, this you see, this building is about to fall. The suffering is of, of, of the largest magnitude I've ever seen and I you know I've been to a lot of places, I've seen a lot but nothing like this. When I think of a moral leader, I think of Mirra Sargon Chavez. have the energy. I know, I'm finished, I'm finished. <laughs> so our money used to be called shekel. And for the first time in, since the fall of Nineveh, uh, I hope you don't have one. Okay. So Dr. Bilos Polis of Chicago created the new Assyrian shekel. And it has, uh, underneath it has an explanation and the authentication papers. It's called the Lamassu coin. So I'd like to present it on behalf of my organization, ICRC, to you. So this uh, Lamassu coin has two sides, like every other coin, right? <laughs> uh, Lamassu is on one side and the image of a woman and a man in Homala outfits and the traditional Assyrian outfits. So I'd like to present this to you, my dear, an exemplary moral leader. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you.
you know, uh, to do all this work, you have to have support of your family. And of course, my wife sitting here, without her help, without her 100% support, I cannot do what I'm trying to do. As you all know, I'm involved in a lot of, yes, these are that. You know, um, what keeps you awake is knowing we have Australians who need help. And working for my nation, UMTI, keeps me going. I can't stop. And I get energy. Just knowing I'm helping somebody out there who probably doesn't have food on the table, or somebody who is sick, or somebody having surgery but they don't have money, I jump on the wagon. I call people like Dr. Robert <laughs> and others who are uh, involved in, uh, in helping the Syrians throughout the world. It uh, uh, makes me really feel within me. I feel that satisfaction and I, when I go to bed, put my head down, I feel good. Thanks the Lord. And thank you all for your support. The foundation could not exist without the support of the members and supporters throughout the Bay Area and throughout the world. Actually, we get donations from all over. Thanks to the Lindwin mm -hmm. Magazine, spreads the word, all the work we do. And Dr. Nenwe Baraha has been at it for over 10 years. Nenwe, Bella, 10 years. And before that, Dr. Robert Korokan, and before that, my cousin Trubis Chavez and others to keep the, to keep the voice of the foundation throughout the world. Basim Taraba Juliana, I love you. You know that. And keep up the good work and stay healthy. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.